today. Please find a comfortable place in your seat and take a few easy breaths as we settle into our shared silence together. And now, will you join me in this prayer, written by Lynn Cox. Spirit of life and love, known by many names and yet fully known by no one, we give thanks for this time and this place of renewal. We give thanks for the ability to begin again after the disaster, after the tragedy, after the loss, after meeting the challenges set before us. Grant us the courage to continue on the journey, the courage to speak up for the well-being of others and ourselves and the planet. May we forgive each other when our courage falls short, and may we try again. Grant us hearts to love boldly, to embody our faith and our values in living words and deeds. May our hearts be open to embrace humility, grace, and reconciliation. Grant us the ability to learn and grow, to let the spirit of love and truth work its transformation upon us and within us. Grant us the spirit of hospitality, the willingness to sustain a fit dwelling place for the holy that resides in all being. Grant us a sense of being at peace in the world, even as we are in motion. Let us cultivate together the strength to welcome every kind of gift, and all manner of ways to be on the journey together. To this, we add the silent prayers of our hearts. Blessed be, we ask these things for ourselves, for those we love, and for those whom we do not love. Amen. I have two short poems for this morning's reading. The first is by Adam Zegajewski translated by Claire Kavanaugh. Try to praise the mutilated world. Remember June's long day and wild strawberries, drops of wine, the dew, the nettles that methodically overgrow the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watch the stylish yachts and ships. One of them had a long trip ahead of it while salty oblivion awaited others. You've seen the refugees heading nowhere. You've heard the executioners sing joyfully. You should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtain fluttered. Return in thought to the concert where music flared. 
You gathered acorns in the park in autumn and leaves eddied over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world and the gray feather a thrush lost and the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. The second is an excerpt from a poem by Alta. One hesitates to bring a child into this world without fixing it up a little. Paint a special room, stop sexism, learn how to love, vow to do it better than it was done when you were a baby, vow to make, if necessary, new mistakes, vow to be awake for the birth, to believe in joy, even in the midst of unbearable pain. And now, will you welcome to our screen the Reverend Hannah Capaldi. I want to open my sermon with a quote from John Steinbeck's East of Eden. When a child first catches adults out, when it first walks into his grave little head that adults do not always have divine intelligence, that their judgments are not always wise, their thinking true, their sentences just, his world falls into panic desolation. The gods are fallen and all safety gone. And there is one sure thing about the fall of gods. They do not fall a little. They crash and shatter or sink deeply into green muck. It is a tedious job to build them up again. They never quite shine. And the child's world is never quite whole again. It is an aching kind of growing. I was at a birthday party for my sister-in-law a few years back. She sat on the floor unwrapping presents and as a great lover of reading and books, she received the most appropriate of presents, the complete box set of Laura Ingalls Wilder. Everyone oohed and odd, but I was the only one who spoke through tears. Oh my God, I loved those books. The stories of Laura Ingalls Wilder's pioneer days were foundational texts in my development as a headstrong, nature-loving girl. The stories of her life fed my early feminist spirit and captured a kind of freedom and wildness for me that I didn't see in the more masculine narratives of Gary Paulson or Jack London. She was tough and self-sufficient, living life with skinned knees and raw hems. I read on the banks of Plum Creek probably four times. These happy golden years, maybe six. I consider Almanzo to be on the short list for potential baby names, and I was Laura for Halloween when I was eight. I was a total fangirl. You might have called her my hero. And I wasn't the only one. She was and continues to be super popular, capturing and preserving a specific cultural moment in history that illuminated an entire generation of American life. Wilder herself remarked during a speech at a Detroit book fair in 1937 that she had come to understand that in my own life, I represented a whole period of American history. So, it was in June 2018 that I was faced with a reckoning of my own personal hero. When the Association for Library Services to Children renamed the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award the Children's Literacy Legacy Award. The association wrote in their press release, quote, ALSC has had to grapple with the inconsistency between Wilder's legacy and its core values of inclusiveness, integrity, and respect and responsiveness through an award that bears Wilder's name. Turns out my hero and the entire period of American history that she recounted so faithfully and had come to represent included a lot of racism, a lot of bigotry and xenophobia in that push for westward, westward expansion in the insistence of Laura's father to move west and take up the 160 acres that were offered by the Homestead Act of 1892, Wilder elided the truth of what that meant for the millions of people who were already living there. 
the 160 acres wasn't the government's to give and it wasn't the Ingalls to claim, to farm and till and build. Their homesteading was an invasion predicated on broken treaties and indiscriminate killing of Native American communities. And I knew this. I knew this in my heart and in my soul. I knew it in my brain and in the hours I had spent arguing against ideas of colonialism in all its forms throughout history. But somehow I was dismayed and hurt to find it showing up in my own personal mythology to disrupt the way I saw myself, to disrupt the heroes I cherished and the stories that made me who I am. Because when I revisited those pages in my mind, I remembered Laura riding horses across wide open plains. I remembered her twisting hay with blue black cold fingers during the long winter, eating cornbread with molasses and swimming in the creek. What I didn't remember what I came to find when I looked back were the casual and offhand references to half-breeds littering the pages, the common refrain of a good Indian is a dead Indian, the long passages recounting the Ingalls family fear and courage that intertwined to make them seem heroic and facing down the threat of native people out west. Heroes are precarious things. They require a white knuckle grip on history, a white knuckle grip on the passage of time in order for heroes to remain heroic. They require us to be stuck, to be stagnant and tensed against any indication that our heroes were somehow anything less than what we needed them to be. ALSC wrote in their press release that they were grappling with inconsistencies between their values and the legacy of Wilder. So I have loosened my white knuckle grip on my hero. And I too have been grappling with inconsistencies between my own Unitarian Universalist values and the people I look to as paragons made all the more complex by my long held affection for the stories and what they represented to me. That's the tricky thing about privilege. It's myopic. The same novels that made me feel affirmed have in them the capacity to diminish someone else. The same words that built me up have the power to gloss over someone's dignity to eradicate their story, their triumphs, their legacy of resilience. Because the truth is, as a young white girl in Concord, Massachusetts, I didn't read these novels and squirm. But I bet any native child would. I bet any brown child would. And in a showing of solidarity, in a recognition that we cannot be free until we all are free, we grapple with inconsistencies and we loosen our white knuckle grip on history. We release that tension in our hands that clings to the status quo. Those parts of history that we insist upon, despite knowing full well that history is a slippery subjective form. In unclenching our fists on the narratives we grew up on, we embrace humility and the possibility that what was good for us can be damaging for someone else. We accept that change is inevitable and that the gods of our lives may have been the devils for others. And we open our hearts to reimagining how former idols fit into the story now. Steinbeck wrote, when we realize that people are not perfect, that they are wrong sometimes, our worlds fall into panicked desolation. All safety gone. And we are left wondering, who or what is next? To be stripped of titles, renamed, canceled, we think with panicked desolation, could it be me? But to stay in that moment of panic at the realization that our heroes are in fact human is to forget our own religious roots. Christ was not God. 
and God was not Christ. We prefer fallibility. We chose the human Jesus over the divine Jesus. We prefer the complexity that comes with being human. We are the living tradition, one that upholds the holy process of change. As Unitarian Universalists, we believe that the white knuckle grip on history is soul crushing. There's nothing spiritually nourishing about stagnation. There's nothing faithfully joyful in never learning or growing. The living tradition that we all are a part of is one that wills us to accept that we will make mistakes, that we too are fallible like Christ, and that in relinquishing our white knuckle grip on rightness, we make space for something far, far more important. The Dr. Maya Angelou wrote, when you know better, do better. I keep this phrase close at hand and close to my heart. In order to know better, in order to do better, you must be prepared to have been doing it wrong. In order to know better so that you might do better, you must be open to the possibility that humility is humbling. I think we forget just how much aching is a part of growing. I am always surprised by how getting it wrong stings so much, how my mind and my spirit run rampant with guilt and shame. But I remember Dr. Angelou's words. Now I know better, so I can do better. When it comes to matters of racial justice, when it comes to making amends and accepting the wrongness of our actions, whether they be a hundred years prior, decades prior, or just yesterday, we remember the aching part of growing. We remember that the Unitarian roots of our faith prefer us to be imperfect. And we remember the universalist part of our faith that says there will be good things awaiting us ahead. We believe in naming that which we got wrong, in saying we used to think this way and now we know different and now we can do better. And we are always given a chance to come back into right relationship with ourselves and with our community and with that which some call God. I've done this with Laura Ingalls Wilder. I invite you to do it with your own heroes and personal paragons as well. All it takes is a pause, a beat or a breath, to remember that we are all fallible and that mistakes are okay, but that doing better is the demand of the day. Doing better by relinquishing our heroes who have hurt others, doing better by letting history be told from a different point of view and accepting that as true doing better by seeing our own mistakes as opportunities for growth and doing better by moving through panic, moving through despair and into that brave new place where all are given their due dignity. May it be so and amen. Thank you. And now will you rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Shut 
say 